a soldier, separated from his team, finds himself disoriented, lost in what could be a hostile environment. Without food or water, in unfamiliar surroundings, can he survive? Could you survive? My Cherokee ancestors lived their whole life in the mountains and swamps of North Carolina because they knew what they could eat and what they couldn't, and what was good for them and what wasn't. I'm Master Sergeant Squire from the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. I'm going to show you some plants that you can use for food to keep you alive in a survival situation. Tell you what parts are all right and what parts are not. How to prepare those foods before you eat them and when to avoid them. I'm going to increase your awareness of the world around you and this will make you more comfortable in the outdoors and increase your chances of survival. There are many different species of wild onion and garlic. They're usually found in open sunny areas and can be very hard to tell apart. If you cut a wild onion across the bulb, it will have concentric rings or little circles like onion rings. The garlic will have many individual cloves like those purchased in the store. A key factor or characteristic for recognizing wild onions and garlic is the characteristic onion or garlic smell. If you find something that looks like a wild onion bulb but doesn't have an onion smell, don't eat it. Some relatives of the onion, such as daffodils and some of the lilies, can be poisonous. Garlic and onion are easily found in cool weather, but are dormant in summer, making them harder to locate during the warm season. Since onions are so easily recognized, survivors often overeat them, resulting in upset stomachs. You can eat the bulbs of the onion and garlic just as they are, put them in a soup or stew, or place them inside your game to flavor it. Both have a stronger odor and taste than the garden varieties, so it doesn't take as many to achieve the same flavor when cooked. You can use the green parts just like chives. To make onion soup, you boil the bulbs and then add the green parts just before it's finished. This soup contains several vitamins and a large quantity of sulfur, which helps in healing. Therefore, can be very important in a survival situation. There are many different varieties of mint, which peppermint and spearmint are the most common. The wild mints are easy to recognize because of a characteristic square stem. If you cut them across the stem and look down at it, it will seem as if you are looking into a small square box. The Latin family name is labiatea, which means lips. And if you look closely at the flowers, they look as if they have little lips. Mint is a very helpful plant in a survival situation because it contains chemicals which will both settle the stomach and calm the nerves. This can assist you in sleeping. Doctors often prescribe mint oil or peppermint tea for pregnant women who have upset stomachs and don't want to take drugs and are allergic to Dramamine. Also, mints are used throughout the world as a spice for flavoring meats that have a gamey or overly sweet taste such as venison, lamb, or pork. Mint can be found in moist areas during most of the year. Wild mustard is a biennial plant found throughout the United States and in much of the other parts of the world at about any time of the year. A key factor in recognizing wild mustard is the four-petal flower, which gives it the nickname of crucifer, meaning cross-like. These flowers can be purple, yellow, or white, and they look just like a cross. Another key characteristic to use in recognition is the mustard smell and taste. After the flowers are gone, a seed pod forms which contains several seeds. When the pods are green, they can be placed in soups, stews, and game meat to provide a hot spicy taste. When these pods mature, they turn brown and hard. You can grind them into a powder and mix it with water or oil made from animal fat or plant substances to make a mustard in the field. Wild mustard greens, which are the tender leaves and stems, provide many nutrients because they're very high in vitamin A and C. Some wild mustard is also called wild horseradish because it develops a thickened rootstock like horseradish. This rootstock can be grated and used as a flavoring. If they're not too spicy, you can use them just like a radish.
Duck is one of our most common edible wild plants. It can be found in open sunny areas and disturbed ground. It has many common names and comes in many varieties, such as curly duck, yellow duck, greater duck, and narrow duck. Yellow duck is recognized because of the bright yellow or orange color when you cut the root. Early settlers used these roots to dye cloth. If you boil any dock root, you will have a good antifungal medicine for athlete's foot or other rashes caused by fungus. The tender, flexible dock roots can be boiled and eaten. The green leaves can be chopped up for a salad green or boiled for a cooked green with a lemony taste. Dock is also referred to as wild okra because the stalks contain a mucilaginous chemical similar to okra. When boiled, it resembles boiled okra with the same type of sliminess in the water. You can chop the raw stems into little pieces and fry them to make something similar to fried okra. Doc is also referred to as wild buckwheat, and in fact, it's in the buckwheat family. When the plant matures, it produces a triangular seed head, which can be ground into a high protein flour with a buckwheat taste. Plantain is a plant which was brought to this country by the early English colonists. There are many varieties of plantain. The most common are broadleaf plantain, or plantago major, or narrowleaf plantain, plantago lanceolata. Plantain is an excellent food source because the entire plant is edible during one season or another. The tender green leaves can be chopped up and used in salads. As the leaves become older, they become tough, stringy, and bitter. However, when parboiled, they make a delicious cooked green and have an anti-diarrheal effect on the body. The leaves also contain a chemical which aids in healing. Place crushed leaves as a poultice on wounds or burns to speed healing and to help fight infection. The seed heads look like those hung in bird cages. The seeds are very high in protein. When green and tender, they can be chopped and added to soups or stews or eaten raw. When the seeds are mature and hard, they can be ground into a flour or roasted on a hot rock or toasted in a pan as a substitute for peanuts. The husk are used in making some commercial medications as laxatives. In China, daylilies are grown as a food plant because the entire plant is edible. It was transported from China to England, however, as an ornamental flower, and the European settlers brought it to this country as such. Daylilies grow in open sunny areas, disturbed fields, and old home sites. They're common throughout the country. Once you find last year's old stems, you can follow them down to the ground for tubers or swellings on the rootstalks, much like potatoes. These can be chopped up and eaten raw, but like the water chestnut, they don't have very much flavor. However, when the roots are boiled, they develop a taste like sweet corn. Wild food enthusiasts pickle the roots to use in relishes. The shoots, flowers, and young leaves can be eaten raw or chopped up and added to salads. A word of caution, however, if you eat many raw daylily flowers, they will act as a mild laxative. Therefore, you are better off cooking them. The flowers have a hot, spicy taste and are a favorite in oriental cooking. Oriental food stores sell both the dried and fresh flowers. The flowers can be cooked as a fritter, or when dried, they can be added to soups and stews as a thickener. The Jerusalem artichoke is sometimes called wild sunflower. The scientific name is Helianthus tuberosus. Helianthus tells us it is indeed a sunflower, and tuberosus refers to the tubers or knotty growths under the ground. All through the winter months, you can follow last year's rootstalks of this perennial plant down to the ground to the tubers, or what we call the Jerusalem artichoke. In the western part of this country, artichokes are similar to the flowers of a thistle, but in the southeast, it is the root of this sunflower plant. It can be used in the same way as a potato, boiled, fried, or baked, and it can be eaten raw. Rock rose, or purslane, 
is a creeping, succulent plant that is often found in people's yards and gardens, but is originally a wild plant throughout much of the country. It provides a natural source of vitamin C and A and is easily recognized by the five petal flower that appears not to have a stem because it attaches itself so closely to the growing stalk. This ground-hugging plant will bloom from the spring to the winter during warm periods. You can chop up the entire plant and eat it raw or boil it for a cooked green. Another plant that blooms in the spring as well as during warm spells in the winter are the wild violets. They could have blue, yellow, or white flowers and heart-shaped or oblong leaves, but the flowers always have two petals up and three petals down. When fresh, they have a nice smell, but they lose all their fragrance and flavor when dried. You can eat all parts of the violet, the leaves, the roots, and the flowers. The wild violet flower was used to make one of the first candies by the English colonists when they came to this country. They would dip the flowers in egg white, then into sugar, let it dry, and repeat the process until they had crystallized violet flowers. There are so many different species of wild violets that they are simply called viola species. Knotweed goes by many names. It is called smartweed because it leaves a burning, stinging taste in your mouth. But this is made mild when you mix it with other greens. This particular species is also called lady's thumb because if you look at the leaves, it has purple and brown markings that are about the size and shape of a lady's thumbprint. There are so many varieties of knotweed that they are lumped together by scientists and called polygonotum species. Japanese knotweed, another variety, is also called wild bamboo by some people. However, it is not a bamboo at all. It looks a lot like bamboo because of its tall, grass-like stems with knots in it. If you cut open the plant, you'll see that it is hollow and that these knots are actually dividers that section off the plant. This plant is also called mock rhubarb as well as other names. The plant has many uses and a lemony flavor. When the shoots first come up, they can be steamed, boiled, or eaten raw. However, they can be bitter, so cooking is best. As the stem matures and gets taller, you can break it open and eat the lining inside, which will have a lemon or rhubarb taste. This is what people use to make a mock rhubarb jam or pie. This is a common plant along roadsides in open areas where the ground has been disturbed. And there are areas where you can find great colonies of this plant. There are many varieties of cactus, which have been called by such names as beaver tail, prickly pear, Indian pear, desert rose, and a Cherokee rose. The entire plant can be eaten, but you have to be careful of the spines. It is common for people in the southwest to eat the leaves, and they even sell them in the stores as nopales or nopalitos, with a warning that you must use a potato peeler to remove the spines. When the plant is chopped up and eaten raw, it has a cucumber texture and taste with just a hint of lemon. If you don't like them raw, because they tend to be slimy, you can parboil them. After the first boiling, pour off the water to remove the sliminess, add more water, and boil them again. Once cooked in this manner, they will have the consistency of cut green beans and can be chopped and added to omelets or used with other ingredients for tacos, burritos, or salads. Or they can be eaten alone as a cooked vegetable. The leaves, when split lengthwise, can be placed on wounds. The slimy material in them will work much like aloe vera to heal wounds and burns on the surface of the body. The flowers, though short-lived, can be eaten raw. The flowers are followed by round, egg-shaped fruits that are either purple, yellow, or red, and range in size from the end of your little finger up to the size of a chicken egg. When ripe, the fruit will be tender and can be eaten raw or boiled to make a high vitamin C drink, jelly, or syrup. Ounce for ounce, these fruits contain more vitamin C than an orange. The seed inside the fruit are very hard, but can be ground into a high protein flour. Sheep sorrel is a relative of the dock plant. 
This plant is also grown in gardens in other parts of the world. Cream of sorrel soup brings a high price in gourmet restaurants. Sheep sorrel is easily recognized because the leaves are characteristically shaped like an arrowhead. In the spring, large stalks produce red flowers. When you see these flowers, it appears as if the entire field is on fire. The leaves and tender stalks can be eaten raw, chopped and added to other greens, or boiled and eaten as a cooked vegetable. In the summer, when it's very hot, the leaves can be chopped and soaked in water to make a survival drink which has a cooling effect on the body. It has a high ascorbic acid or vitamin C content and a pleasant citrus flavor and lemony smell. One of our most common and easily recognized weeds is the dandelion, Taraxacum officinale, which translated from the Latin means the official cure for disorders. Throughout history, many medical problems have reportedly been cured by the dandelion. For the survivor, it provides food since all of its parts are edible. The greens are very high in vitamin C, A, and calcium and can be eaten raw or boiled. The flour can be dipped in batter and fried into fritters. They are also the part of the plant used to make dandelion wine. Where the leaves meet the roots, there is a pink or white crown that is protected from the sun by the leaves. In gourmet food stores, this crown brings quite a high price. The crown is a lot more tender and sweeter than the rest of the plant. As dandelions grow older, usually after they flower, the leaves develop a bitter taste caused by a white milky sap or latex. This is one of the characteristics in identifying dandelions from some of its lookalikes, called the false dandelion. If you break the leaf stem of the dandelion, it will be hollow and exude the white sap. Lookalikes don't do that. The roots of the dandelion can also be very useful to a survivor. One of the things some people miss most in a survival situation, other than cigarettes, is coffee. The roots can be dry roasted on a hot rock next to a fire, or if preparing at home as a learning experience in an oven with the door open. After the roots are brown and crisp, they can be ground and boiled just like coffee to produce a coffee substitute which is caffeine free and naturally sweet. The dogtooth violet or trout lily is a spring flowering plant that lives in coniferous and hardwood forest in shady areas and often near water. The edible parts of this plant are the leaves and the bulbs. You can recognize it early by its yellow, bell-shaped flowers. It is actually a lily and not a violet. The important recognition factors later are the mottled leaves, which have two different shades of brown and green on them. You should boil the leaves when they are young and tender for about eight to 10 minutes. You can also boil or bake the bulbs and eat them like a potato. Fiddlehead ferns doesn't refer to a particular variety of fern, but to a stage of their growth. When the young leaves first come out of the ground, they're curled up like the head of a fiddle, and that's how they get their name. The two types of ferns we're looking at here are the ostrich fern, which is the one with the hair, and the bracken. Both of these are found in moist woods and can be eaten at any time of year, while the young leaf frond is uncurling. But the most common time of year for harvesting them is the spring when they are most plentiful. When the leaves uncurl and mature, they develop a toxin and are considered unsafe to eat. The little fiddleheads are the only safe part to eat on these plants. They can be either boiled or sauteed, but they must be cooked before you eat them. Wild ginger can be boiled to make a tea that calms the stomach. It also raises the metabolism and by so doing, provides warmth from inside the body as you drink the tea. The root can also be used to flavor game. The only part that you can use is the root, as nothing else is edible. It can be identified by the heart-shaped leaves and the little brown bell-like flowers. Wild asparagus is one of our favorite spring greens. The scientific name is Asparagus officinale. Anytime you see the word officinale in a scientific name, you will know that the plant has been used or recognized as a medicinal plant by some government agency. 
Asparagus should not be eaten raw because it may upset the stomach or act as a laxative. The edible part of this plant looks like little green fingers coming out of the ground. Wild carrot is one of those plants that we use smell as a recognition factor. If you find a plant that looks like a carrot but does not have a carrot smell, avoid it. This plant has some toxic relatives such as poison hemlock and water hemlock which are related to the wild carrot since they all fall in the parsley family. Poison hemlock and water hemlock are so deadly that if you have any doubts at all, don't eat it. People have died from eating a single bite of poison hemlock. Wild carrots generally grow in a drier environment while their poisonous relatives usually grow in a moist environment. First, pull the plant out of the ground and check for the carrot smell. Wild carrots have a yellow or white root instead of the orange root like the garden variety we're used to seeing. The root may or may not be branched depending on the soil it grows in, but it will always have the definite carrot smell. Wild carrot has many common names. It is called Queen Anne's Lace because of the white lacy flowers. It may also be called tickweed because generally there is one flower head or floret that is purple while the others are white, giving the plant the appearance that a tick is on it. It is also called a bird nest plant because after the flowers are matured, the seed heads curl up to look like a little bird nest on a stem. When it has seeds, you can boil them to make a tea that is an anti-flatulent or helps to fight gas. Originally, wild carrots were a medicinal plant used to cleanse the kidneys as an eye wash or taken internally as a medicine to help improve eyesight. Poke is one of our favorite spring greens and is usually called poke salad or poke salad, spelled S-A-L-L-E-T, which is actually an old English word that means cooked green. This plant cannot be eaten raw and you can only eat the young tender leaves from a plant up to a height of about 10 inches. If any red coloring is found on the leaves or stem, you should not eat them. The young tender leaves must be boiled in two changes of water before being eaten. All other parts of the plant are considered to be poisonous. They're used in the preparation of commercial medicines for heart ailments because they slow down the heart rate. People have died trying to medicate themselves with it. The berries which form later are also poisonous. Therefore, the only time of year you can use poke is in the spring when it is a young shoot or during warm spells when it sprouts in colder months. Only eat the young tender leaves without any red coloring and only after they have been cooked. Chickweed is familiar to many of us and there are many different varieties. It is a rambling little weed used in some commercial weight loss preparations because it supposedly has a chemical that dissolves fat. If you look at the list of ingredients on various weight loss preparations, you may see the word stellaria listed, which means that it contains chickweed. The word stellaria means like a star, and if you look at the little white flowers, they look like stars. You can eat the entire plant, raw or cooked. Kudzu is a vine that was brought here in the early 20s from Japan to control erosion. Unfortunately, it's gotten out of hand because in this country it has no natural enemies. It has taken over in some areas and has actually killed entire forests by strangling the trees. It has become an unwanted pest, and even though the government brought it here, it is now illegal in some places to plant it. You can eat the tender shoots, raw or boiled. The flowers, which form later, can be boiled or pickled and then eaten. They form clusters of purple or pink pea-like flowers. In Japan, there is a major industry harvesting the roots to make starch. However, this is not an option for the survivor because the roots can be six feet below ground level and weigh several hundred pounds. Sassafras is a plant familiar to many of us as a tea. Sassafras was the very first cash crop exported back to England by the colonists. When they arrived in what is now the United States, they found the Indians drinking it because of its licorice flavor and medicinal benefits. One common name for it is green stick because many of the trees have a green stem. It is normally found between woods and fields and is a very common plant throughout much of the country. 
is easy to recognize during the growing season because it has three different shaped leaves on each tree. One has three lobes like a chicken's foot or a bear's claw. A second leaf has a shape like a catcher's mitt or mitten, giving it the common name of mitten tree. The third leaf has a typical elongated leaf shape. The leaves are sold commercially as filet powder in gourmet food shops or in gourmet sections of the market. They're also typically used in Cajun or Creole cooking. You can make this powder yourself by drying the leaves and grinding them up. This powder can be used as a soup thickener or flavor. The tea is made from the roots. Just pull them out of the ground and boil the roots to make tea. If you have a source of sugar, you can sweeten it and it will taste and smell much like root beer. When you pull a tree out of the ground that you think is a sassafras tree, the characteristic smell of root beer will help identify it. You can also chew on the roots to freshen your breath. Some people call this a toothbrush tree because the young, tender twigs can be slivered and rubbed against the teeth when you don't have a toothbrush. It contains a chemical that will kill bacteria and makes your breath and mouth feel much fresher. The bay tree is commonly found in this country. Bay leaves used in Italian cooking for making sausage and in soups and stews are related to this tree. Look for the characteristic bay leaf smell when you crush a leaf in your hand. The leaves themselves are too hard to digest so like those bay leaves bought in the store, you use these bay leaves for flavoring your cooking and then throw them away before serving. If the leaf doesn't have the characteristic bay leaf smell, don't use it because there are some lookalikes in the magnolia family or sweet bays that are poisonous to eat. 